The JSA is on the run when Jade Stone, one of Amanda Waller's amazing robots, absorbs Alan Scott's star heart power. But Amanda Waller didn't plan for what happens next. We're going to talk about it in our review of Absolute Power Task Force 7 Number 3 from DC Comics. See you in three. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Absolute Power Task Force 7 Number 3. So far, the Task Force 7 tie-in miniseries hasn't added much value to the overall event. You get some background information, maybe some nuanced scenes that fill in one or two gaps, and a couple of cool moments here and there. But nothing that makes the Absolute Power event seem bigger or meaningful or adds in pieces that make it more important until now. DC is relying heavily on Mark Wade to save their collective bacon with an Amanda Waller-centric crossover. Not the best creative choice because nobody is really a fan of Amanda Waller, and I mean that in every sense. But Jeremy Adams is turning out to be the go-to guy to take a lemon and make some decent lemonade out of it. Absolute Power Task Force 7 Number 3 isn't perfect, but it is one of the better tie-ins so far. When last we left the JSA in Green Lantern Number 13, which was the tie-in in and of itself, Alan Scott and the team fought valiantly against the Amazo robot known as Jade Stone. The JSA lost the fight easily, but Salem teleported several team members away to Hal Jordan's trailer looking for help from, in my opinion, the world's greatest Green Lantern. Meanwhile, Hal Jordan endured torture at the hands of Amanda Waller's goons, leading to an escape and the discovery of a large weapons cache, all this taking place presumably on Gamora Island. That brings us to Absolute Power Task Force 7 number 3, the current issue, and it's all JSA all the time. There's no Hal Jordan in this issue. Jade Stone uses the super speed it stole from Jesse Quick to immediately catch up to the JSA at Hal Jordan's trailer. It latches onto Alan Scott and fully absorbs his power. In a surprise move, Jade Stone suddenly shuts down. The team decides not to waste the breather, so they go with Salem's suggestion to find a ley line nexus that will take them to the Tower of Fate for refuge. The team loads up a van, brings along an unconscious Carol Ferris who they found there at the destroyed trailer. Then they head off to look for wherever one of these Nexus lines might be so that they can find the Tower of Fate. If there are one or two down points in Jeremy Adams' turn on the miniseries, it's the number of off-panel developments that need to be explained to get to this point. We can infer Hal's trailer was destroyed and Hal was certainly captured when Amanda Waller's goons showed up at the end of Green Lantern number 12. That's how long ago that was. But you never see it. You only get the aftermath after a significant chunk of missing time. So what's happening is Jeremy Adams is struggling to catch up by just explaining things that happened in the middle of his existing run, which heavily implies his main Green Lantern title was sidelined in a hurry, which is not a great way to start off the issue. Later, the Amazo robot wakes up or reactivates after its body is consumed by the Green Lantern star heart energy. Now remember, Alan Scott's power is different than Hal Jordan and Guy Gardner and every other Green Lantern you can think of. Alan Scott's Green Lantern power is based on the Star Heart, which effectively is a form of magic. Through the robot's inner monologue, aided by Dave Sharp's super smart lettering. So Dave Sharp did a great job with the lettering in this issue. We see the robot is struggling to reconcile Waller's directive with these now intrusive thoughts that keep popping up. It doesn't know where it's coming from and it's trying to figure out what decisions and which directive to follow. It decides to return to Waller and report what happened waiting for more instructions. And now we get into the meat and potatoes that actually now makes this issue worth it. Without too much trouble at all you quickly get to see what's happening. The Amazo robot is quote-unquote infected with Green Lantern's star heart energy and it's playing havoc with its programming. This development is both cool and smart because it's an intriguing way to get the imagination gears turning. Will the star heart magic turn Jade Stone against Amanda Waller? What would happen if the good guys had an Amazo on their side with the powers of a Green Lantern? I, I don't know what, how it's going to turn out exactly, although we are going to get some answers here pretty quickly, but it's an intriguing development and I want to know more. When the Amazo robot gets back to base, Amanda Waller is very unhappy Jade Stone has returned empty-handed. Waller orders Jade Stone to invade the Oblivion Bar at all costs because she believes Alan Scott is a major threat to her operations and he must be captured. During Jade Stone's dressing down, it starts to consider whether or not Amanda Waller is the real threat. So the earlier development about the Star Heart quote-unquote infection seems to be coming into effect here. And if it gets your creativity juices flowing, wondering which direction it's going to go, Adam smartly doesn't waste time leaving you wondering. It's clear the Amazo is confused, and every action it takes hereafter is an uncertain one, which could lead to a reversal of fortune for our heroes. 
Jade Stone arrives at one of the entrances to the Oblivion Bar, uses an advanced level of magical power to break through. There we find many magical powered individuals are waiting out Waller's attack, just trying to take uh, shelter and refuge. Jade Stone demands the location of the Tower of Fate, but the patrons decide they're not going to comply in any stretch, and they let their spells do the talking with the start of a massive magical brawl. All right, at this point, Jeremy Adams gets a big thumbs down, a big raspberry, and a big boo, boo, and a hiss. The scene marks the second down point of the issue, although it's a small one. In a relatively action-free tie-in, there's not a whole lot of action in this issue. Adams has the opportunity to show off a big brawl of magical proportions and again leaves the fight off panel to save page space. This could have been the big wow moment and they just gloss right past it. Yes, you have to be economical with your page spaces because there's budgetary concerns and all those things and being economical is critical. But that means the overarching plot wasn't spaced out properly. The lack of planning may or may not be Adam's fault, but the net result is you have an issue that could have had a big punch and it didn't. The issue ends with a brief aside to show how Steve Trevor is faring on Gamora Island, which keeps popping up in every single Absolute Power tie-in, so presumably there's something important going on there, but it's not clear at this point why. You get a confrontation at the gates of the Tower of Fate, so that eventually brings all the parties together, and you get a sacrificial choice, and you can pretty much infer what that's all about, but we'll leave it for readers to figure it out for themselves without spoiling it. Overall, this is one of the stronger, smarter, and better developed tie-ins to Absolute Power, despite the few annoying shortcuts noted above, and I think part of that is not exactly Jeremy Adams' fault. Given his success on Flash, Green Lantern, and now this tie-in for Task Force 7, DC would do well to lock Jeremy Adams down as the fix-it guy, because he seems to kind of take everything that's really, really broken and at least make something decent out of it. Let's switch gears and talk about the art for a second. Marco Santucci gives this issue his all with grounded panel compositions, cool character designs, especially for Jade Stone, and all-around solid figure work. There are a few spots where if you get into the wider panels, faces look slightly deformed, but the comic generally looks good overall. It's bright, it's vivid, it's energetic, and even though there's no action really that takes place in this issue, it's, it's visually engaging overall. So final thoughts, what do we think about Absolute Power Task Force 7 number 3? It's definitely one of the better tie-ins to the Absolute Power event because it maintains consistency across titles. If you look at the bridge between Green Lantern number 13 and this issue, it's pretty seamless, although there is a big gap in there. Uh, you get some intriguing developments, particularly with Jade Stone now conflicted about his prime directives, and it presents it all in a relatively pre-packaged. Adams continues to prove he's the DC guy who can make lemons out of lemonade, and Santucci's solid art is made better, particularly by Arif Prianto's excellent coloring. Therefore, Absolute Power Task Force 7 number 3 earns a solid 8 out of 10. I think this is one of the strongest Absolute Power issues outside of what Mark Wade's main story. But, you know, that's my opinion. What do you think? Do you have high hopes for Absolute Power? Give us a thumbs up if you're a DC fan and leave us a comment below with your thoughts on how Absolute Power will end up. Also remember to click on the link in the description to read the written review and buy this comic to help support the channel. It would be greatly appreciated and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. So thanks for joining and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.